So hello everyone, my name is Yan Yan Li. I'm from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. So today I want to present about the topic of temporal lobe epilepsy. To start with, I want to present a case that I have seen during my AMIQT rotation. So this is a 42-year-old female. She has a long-standing history of epilepsy, and she had a right temporal lobectomy in 2012. When she presented to us, she said uh, October the 30th, 2024, she experienced a seizure. The semiology is similar to before. She described it as when she was walking on her way out of home, she suddenly felt a rising sensation from her stomach in a deja vu, a deja vu sensation, and then she fell over the ground. Uh, it is very interesting that uh, she had a video camera in front of her house, which has uh, recorded the whole episode. She lost her consciousness for hours and was discovered by her neighbor three hours later and was sent to the hospital. She then stayed in the hospital for four days and comprehensive workup has been carried out. She reports some residual weakness, fatigue, and some soreness around her body. And when all this happened, she said that she was only taking Capra 50, 500 milligram QD. So about her seizure history, she first had her seizure at age 13. It was in 1995, and it was in 2012 that she underwent the right temporal lobectomy. Then uh, she experienced a eight-year seizure-free time, and it was in 2020, uh, March 2020, she had a breakthrough seizure episode. And two months later, she had another seizure episode uh, in which she totally lost her consciousness, had some drooling and tongue biting. At that time, she went uh, to our clinic and we started her on um, Capra 500 milligram BID and a Lamotrigine 15 milligram BID. And one year after, she had another seizure episode. And then... Uh, Three years later, in April this year, she reported that she had an aura uh, in which her described it as a abdominal pain and sensation. Uh, the episode lasts like two minutes and she retain, retained her awareness during this episode. So at this time, she is only taking Capra 500 milligram once a day and the blood test shows that the Capra is sub sub uh, therapeutic level. And at this time, she had another big seizure. And uh, so we dis we talked with her and decided to start her um, Capra 500 milligram BID. So uh, we have some objective tests done in 2021. She had a MI brain, which showed post-surgical changes of the right temporal lobe with associated encephalomalacia and gliosis. And also in 2022, she had a 72-hour EEG, uh, which shows some slowing of the right hemisphere, and especially the right temporal area. And there are some sharp waves uh, seen coming out of the right hemisphere. Another uh, interesting part of her case is that she does have some psychosis. We're not sure uh, if this is related to her seizure or this is related kind of part of the post-temporal lobectomy complication. So she has some paranoia. She had an ideation that she is being monitored and she is being reported to the government. So she sometimes will come to the clinic uh, wearing hat and glass because she believes that she is being monitored and she may run out of the clinic without her prescription because she believes that she is being uh, reported. And uh, she has also been hospitalized on multiple occasions due to her psychosis. And also she has a cognitive impairment. She reports on memory problems. Uh, she cannot remember faces, names, and she constantly needs to make a list. So it's a very interesting case. And now I want to... Um, talk about the temporal lobe epilepsy. So, so epilepsy is actually a very severe condition, debilitating, affecting um, millions of thousands of million people around the world. And what is focal epilepsy? So focal epilepsy, also known as localization related or partial epilepsy, it arises as a consequence of a focal brain pathology or as a part of syndrome of genetic or unknown causes. 
And with all of the focal epilepsies, those coming from the temporal lobe is the most common. So we can see here, it is a picture of the brain and uh, what is colored is our temporal lobe. So next I want to talk about the different types of temporal lobe epilepsy. Actually, we have two types, the mesotemporal lobe epilepsy and the lateral temporal lobe epilepsy. To begin with, I want to talk about the mesotemporal lobe epilepsy, the MTLE. So basically it involves the hippocampus, parahippocampal gyrus and amygdala. It is the most common form of temporal lobe uh, seizures. And it is really secondary to a pathologic process called hippocampal sclerosis. And I will talk about this more detailly later. Also, we have another type of temporal lobe epilepsy. This is called lateral temporal lobe epilepsy. It is also known as a neocortical temporal lobe epilepsy, and it is very rare. So most commonly, this is secondary to genetic or acquired structural or anatomical uh, lesions. So um, we can see here, uh, this is for the mesotemporal lobe epilepsy, right? This is the uh, hippocampus and this is the amygdala. Okay. So for the next one, I want to talk about the etiology of the uh, temporal lobe epilepsy. So most commonly, this is usually due to the hippocampal sclerosis. Uh, and also it can be due to some infection, all kinds of central nervous system infection, including encephalitis. Uh, it can be due to the tumors, including hematoma or some gliotumors. And also it can be due to some uh, all kinds of traumatic brain injury. Uh, vascular anomalies, genetic re reasons, and some cryptogenic uh, reasons. So now we know that the hippocampal sclerosis is the most common pathology uh, underlying all of these things. I want to dig this more. So we can see from the pathologic uh, examination, uh, what we have is the neuronal loss in the hippocampal structure. It is mainly from the CA1, CA4, and dentate uh, fasciculus region uh, with usually sparing of the CA2 region. We can see from the uh, sliced below, the picture below, that the CA1, CA4, CA3, the neurons are mainly lost with uh, the CA2, still we have many neurons staining here, right? And also uh, accompanied with these all these kind of neuron loss, we will have the astrocytic gliosis. So this is the pathologic findings that uh, is most common with all the surgical treated um, temporal lobe epilepsy patients. And also very interesting is that the presence of the uh, hippocampal sclerosis is, is kind of a progn prognostic factor uh, in the outcome. And actually, it means uh, a better outcome for patients who are surgically treated. So next, I want to talk about the radiographic feature of the hippocampal uh, sclerosis. Typically, what we have is the reduced hippocampal volume and increased T2 signal and abnormal morphology, meaning the loss of internal architecture of the hippocampus. We can see from the coronal uh, image, MRI, uh, this is a T2 sequence. And we can see for the left side of the hippocampus, there is definitely the uh, loss volume of the hippocampus, right? And there is uh, a increased T2 signal compared to the right side. So this all means uh, the kinds of the neuronal atrophy and some gliosis going on. Okay, so next I want to talk about the seizure semiology. So what patients will present with, right? So most commonly uh, for the patients with temporal lobe epilepsy, they will present with focal seizures with impairment of consciousness or awareness. This is a previously known as complex partial seizure. And approximately like one third of patients will also have the focal seizures evolving to bilateral convulsive seizures. And this is also referred as a secondary generalized seizure. 
and only a few people they will have the status epilepticus. So what are the distinctive uh, features of patients about their seizures, right? So the most, so to begin with, I want to talk about an aura. So what is aura here? So actually this is a kind of focal seizure with retained awareness, and it is a focal seizure with sensory or psychic uh, symptoms. Patients will usually describe it as a rising epigastric sensation. It's likening a, a um, rock roller, and some patients will have some psychic or experimental phenomenon, such as a deja vu, jamais vu, or fear sensation. And less, like, uh, less commonly, patients may have some hallucinations, including some taste hallucinations or some olfactory hallucinations. It is worth to mention that uh, this kind of aura or these uh, focal seizure with the retained awareness, they can be isolated or they can be uh, they can proceed with the focal seizure with impairment of consciousness. So next, uh, we will talk about the focal seizure with impairment of consciousness or awareness. So this is the most common type, and patients really will present with a behavioral arrest and staring. The episode usually lasts like 30 to 120 seconds. Um, and very uh, interesting that uh, commonly like 60% of all the patients, they will have automatism. So this is a kind of stereotyped repetitive movement. Uh, so in our temporal lobe epilepsy, the symptoms are usually very mild and it may involve the hands. The patients may have a picking, fidgeting, fumbling with their hands. And also very typical is that they will have some mouth uh, automatism. Very typical findings are chewing and lip smacking. Like, okay, so these are the automatism. And later uh, about the post-ictal period, uh, post-ictal confusion is kind of common. And some patients will kind of... Uh, uh, we'll have some uh, post-ictal psychosis, uh, which will last like days to weeks, but this will, interestingly, will not uh, start immediately after the seizure. And also patients may present with post-ictal hemiparesis, which is uh, contralateral uh, to their localization of their seizure. And uh, the seizure of the dominant hemisphere can also present with the post-ictal aphasia. Then uh, if the patients present to us, how can we evaluate them? Like, so most importantly, it is the EEG. So what we can have is the, uh, the sharp waves and following by some slow, slow waves um, in the EEG, especially uh, in the electrolytes around the temporal region. So we can see on this EEG on the left side that there are some sharp waves and uh, this is very distinct from the background. And also we can have some falling, slowing, slow waves. And also um, this is very specific. And like if we have some repetitive uh, EEG uh, studies or some prolonged ones, it can actually um, uh, diagnose like 90% of the temporal lobe epilepsy. So another uh, modality that is very important is our uh, neural imaging, right? So to begin with, usually we'll have a MRI. MRI are extremely important in finding the hippocampus sclerosing. Um, so like on this on these slides, as we mentioned earlier, there is also on the T2, uh, there is hyper signal, uh, and also we can have the hippocampus atrophy showing here. And what's to mention is that we always want to have a high resolution and thin sliced um, MI study across the hippocampus region so that we can better uh, identify the lesions, right? And also MRI is also important for finding out uh, other etiologies, including like infection, stroke, and vascular anomalies. Also, uh, we can use some functional or some metabolic images, including PET, SPECT, or functional MRI. So all these studies are extremely important for the pre-surgical evaluation to better localize the uh, lesion. 
And then uh, if we evaluate and diagnose the patients, how can we manage them? So to start with, we usually have the pharmacotherapies and definitely the first line is the anti epileptic drug, the AEDs. So the most uh, effective AEDs are those used to treat focal epilepsies, such as the carbamazepine, oxcabazepine, levetiracetam, lamotrigine, or topiramate. We usually use a monotherapy or more oftenly, actually we use a combination of medication to achieve adequate seizure free. Um, but kind of not satisfying is that about one third of patients, they do not have a fully resolution of seizure after initiation of the AEDs. And some patients, they may respond at first, but then they will have some uh, remission of their seizure and then they will generally become some drug resistant uh, epilepsy. And at this time, what we can have is, also, is only the surgical uh, options. So for the non-pharmacological options, we will have the surgical ones or we can have some neurostimulation ones. Uh, for the surgical one, the most uh, effective or safe choice is actually the open sur surgery. We can have some standard anterior lobe, temporal lobe lobectomy as shown on the diagram on the left side. Um, and also we may have some anterior medial temporal lobectomy or selective amygdalohippocampectomy showing the right side. It is more selective and only affect less regions. So actually these surgeries has been proven to have a better uh, long-term outcome compared to with uh, chronic medication use. And also, uh, as we know more about the epileptic networks, uh, the doctors now are now considering some other techniques, including all kinds of uh, minimally invasive techniques like the uh, radio ablation, things like that. And also we can have neurostimulation, uh, including the vagus nerve stim stimulation, but also often these are uh, considered as the options for patients that are not, um, not uh, applicable for the surgical ones. Finally, I want to talk about the clinical cause of the temporal lobe epilepsy. So usually they start with, uh, with adolescence, but um, the age can vary in early, can be like diagnosed from infant, but uh, up to like 32 years old. Uh, but mainly they start with uh, adolescence. And this is a progressive disorder, very unfortunately. Some patients were initially controlled with anti seizure medication, but then they will re emerge and become medically intractable. So, in these cases, the condition will be really tricky. Um, so, and with a longitudinal following up of the neuroimaging, we will find that there is a progressive neurocortical atrophy in patients with drug resistant temporal lobe epilepsy. And for these patients, the timely surgical evaluation are actually very important to help with them. And yeah, so basically, if we want to uh, manage the uh, seizure or the temporal lobe seizure, we should not treat the seizure itself only because a lot of patients will also have some many comorbidities about their cognitive impairment and about all kinds of psychiatric illness. So we should... Uh, take care of all of these things when treating these patients and always give them a good plan. So this is basically all that I have for today's presentation. And these are my reference. And thank you for listening.